Trump in B flat, mellophone in F. We just pulled that out of our vacuum. How did the Reggie Bethany come to ask you to work for the new Savoy Films? Well, I was in New York at NBC Studios, I believe. No, I was with Cass Hagen's band at the Park Central Hotel. I was walking down Broadway one day when I met a guitar and banjo player named Tony Colucci. C-O-L-U-C-C-I. Tony Colucci was playing at NBC in the house band, banjo and guitar. She said, do you want to go to London? And without any hesitation, I said yes. I had been there with Paul Spector. 1926, had worked at the Palace, Royal Palace Hotel in Kensington with Spectrum. I had been to London. So I said, yes. Well, he said, there's a man named Reggie Batten over here. He's looking for the first trumpet player for the Royal Hotel. So he got in touch with Reggie, and he said, I'll tell Reg to go come to the Park Central Hotel. Tell where I was with Cass Hagen, a very good band that had three trumpets and two trombones, one of the early bands with the big brass. Big brass yeah. Let's see, Henry Levine was there already, and Bo Ashby, 
and later went with the Kenneth Gaza Room Orchestra. And uh, so I was with Cass Hagen, a very good band, and I really hated to leave. But when he said London, I thought I'd say yes. So Reggie never did show up to hear me. But I went to the hotel, he arranged, Tony arranged for him to see me. And on a rainy night, I walked from the Piccadilly Hotel in Nia, where he was staying. What was the name of the hotel, Sam? You remember? Was it the Knickerbocker? That's it. What was the Knickerbocker? And I wore a big green slicker raincoat and rubbers, and I walked out of there in the rain. I met Reggie, but he hadn't heard me play, but he took the people's word for it that I could. So when I, we signed the Savoy contract there, that's how it came yeah. out. Uh -huh. What was Reggie Beckman like as a leader? Well, he was very good looking, man. And uh, uh, he was not very communicative. He was easy to work for. No trouble that way. That's all I learned. I didn't find any fault with Reggie. Yeah. Because we were the straight there. We didn't play any jazz at uh, all. I was going to ask you, did you, you, so you never got the chance to play any? No. no we were, Elizalde was the hot one. Yeah. Did, he yeah. with the... did you like working at Savoy? Oh, yes. That was one of the world's great... Yeah. To musical engagements to work in because they had three orchestras there. Yeah. They had a Zigani band. Uh -huh. That's T Z I G O N E. They're from Austria or Yugoslavia, someplace. They had odd instrumentation to play Viennese waltzes and tangos and other uh, Near Eastern type of music mixed in. But we called it a Zigani band. Mm -hmm. And so we had three orchestras, so we only played two sets a night, a half an hour each, and we had rooms to have fun in, punching bags, dark boards, while we waited our turn to play. Great job. Can you remember who did most of the arrangements for the New Savoy Orphans? Irving Bruskin, the American piano player. He went over on another ship when Barney Sorkin is his sex. Oh, yeah. I didn't meet them until in England. I had recorded with Brodsky recently with Sam Lang. Oh, yeah. I didn't know he was going over myself. So, so the job of the new Savoy Orpheans was really just to provide the straight alternative to the hot music provided by Elizalde. Well, that's what we were doing. We just played straight yeah. jazz. Sock arrangements mostly, but some specials by Brodsky. Yeah. You did actually sit in with the Elizalde band on a number of times, didn't you? Yes, well, Chelsea would go to Paris or some place and he couldn't make the plane and didn't come back. Yeah. So I had to go in and I read everything off the site. And Payne, was it Norman Payne? Norman Payne. No, he was there on second trumpet. and Chelsea yeah. was first. Because yeah. I had worked with Chelsea with the California yeah. Rams. He was very young. So I knew. Now. knew well, we were about, all about the same age, I yeah. think. Norman was young, yeah. younger than we were, I, for sure. Did you swap ideas with Chelsea Quigley about trumpet playing? Never did, no. We no. just sat down and played. Said yeah. Yeah. I was playing first in New York with him. And yeah. and, uh, I can, uh, let's see, do I have pictures of him? I'll show you some oh. California Rambo yes. pictures of Thank that group when yeah. we were playing a theater there. Where the Chelsea's in that one. No, he he left during the week. He didn't finish that engagement either. And then I had recorded with him with the California. With the California Ram. But yeah. he always played second, I played first. Yeah. But we didn't have a chance to talk too much about him. Mm -hmm. We were, did what we were told. So, am I speaking too fast? No, that's fine. That's yeah. fine. Did, you, did the band broadcast at all? The, the new Savoy fans. Well, uh, yes, it seems to me we did, yes. Yeah. Uh, that, I can't verify that. Carol Gibbons had always broadcast. I'm quite sure we did. Mm. But I can't... Well, we did with Ambrose, of course, and I'm quite sure we did broadcast with, yeah. with Reggie Batten, too, because they had a wire in there. I'm sure of that. But they didn't make any records, did they? We made some test records for his master's voice, and... The, why we they never, were never issued, I don't know. We did have a couple, of, uh, one recording that, that I recall, but none were ever issued. Mm -hmm. 
Shepherd Colonial Westwood, they broadcast every noon time. And they had a Dixieland band, Ron Trumpet and so forth. And, uh, nice little jazz band really out there. So I'd substitute for the Warren Hookway was the trumpet player with him. So when he couldn't do it, I'd go over occasionally. I was still with Frank Morgan, but that was the noon time session. So Prilly was a pioneer in jazz. Oh, he's on Singapore Sorrows, by the way. Is he? he was with Ambrose then. Before I was with Ambrose, he had been with Ambrose. So when I was making records with Prilly, with McCabe, he was at the Mayfair and I was at the Savoy. But <clears throat> if you listen to uh, Cradle and Caroline, you'll notice the fine work that Prilly did. He knew what to yes. do. Yeah. Well, he's underneath my soul and knows when to play. And uh, then he's playing also on that too, in baritone. Mm -hmm. So that that is one of the nice records that Cradle and Caroline is beautiful recording. The quality is excellent. Yeah. For 1928, it's uh, unbelievable now. Mm -hmm. So that's been reissued, as you know. Who did the arrangements for that? Well, I that was just a makeshift. To, we took the stock around and right. just. Uh, made it, that's all. No rehearsal, nothing. Just you say, you do that, and I'll do this, and that's all I want. When you, when you were coming to do solos on records such as this, um, how often did you sort of practice beforehand the solos? Or we didn't practice anything. You just did it just We did like one that. test for balance, that's yeah. all. That's, he said, you take this, and uh, we run through the stock arrangement once first. He may say, well, you take this course, and you take the break, and then that. Once in a while, we figured out an ending by ear there. I said, I'll do this and probably and something we'll figure out those little endings. Those are stock arrangements. They're head arrangements. Arthur. Some are stuck using that and just dividing the song. But Arthur Lally did do some well, of the But he did uh, some of this that were written up. But uh, they didn't spend too much money on arranging arrangements. So uh, he... It would have been nice had they given him uh, more of a chance to make more yeah. of the arranged type. Because he knew what point. he was doing. Yeah. Good man. How did you come to get that distinctive sound when you're taking a, um, a solo with the sort of the shape? Well, Where well, did you I mean, develop that from? Well, it has no development. If we have an idea in the yeah. you just do it. It's just a hand by brown. Yeah. It's very simple. It's knowing how to use it and when to use it. It's the idea more than the mechanics of it. The mechanic, anybody could make an anti sound. Were you uh, influenced by anyone in particular? Well, I, I listened to all of them, Bix and Nichols and Newman, and, 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 of course. But I never did, I was too busy. I never had been gone to a jam session. After the jobs, I'd go home. But I did listen to records. Then when they wanted jazz, but I never went out nice and played all night long having fun that way. Because yeah. uh, I was a business trumpet player, and I didn't think that to, I didn't uh, try to become a, a real jazz man. Yeah. Had, I think I could have done it a lot better had Spike uh, Hughes kept going. He would have let me, I, I was interested in doing it by that time. Because mm -hmm. you can hear that missing as good as a mile, and that all by yourself in the moonlight. I, that's on Brian's birthday tape. And I was pleased to, that he pulled that out. I didn't know he was going to do that. So that at least the collectors had heard that one, because it's so rare. And did you remember the other one you did then? Why is the bacon so tough? Do you remember that one as well? Why is the bacon so tough? The other? I've done that. I made several recordings yeah, of that. I don't is... remember which. I remember the, doing that number many times with different groups. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a few times. So you take quite a nice solo on that as well. Do I? Yeah. I don't it's think I've a, ever heard that Quite one. a long one. Is that a duo phone? A duo phone. Same session. Oh, yes? Yeah. I don't know. I've never heard that. Yeah. I don't believe I have. I don't remember. Seems to me that by the Baker so tough as a number that won a prize in a newspaper contest. One of those numbers. They used to have contests for And these numbers of women, they'd record who because on the kind of the publicity they would record yeah. such numbers by amateurs. You say yeah. I had a long solo on it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. What about Johnny uh, Helper? Johnny Helper, he was from Boston. Uh, Did you know him before you came 
Yes, I know him slightly in Boston. Mm. I'd met him. I hadn't worked with him, but I knew him. So, and, and then Leo Kahn was a Boston piano player mm. with Halford at the Barclay with Howard Jacobs. He was an American, Howard Jacobs. Halford, well, he, he, uh, he was very reliable, could read. He could play enough clarinet and everything, and the subtone clarinet for the melodic song, and his tenor sound was very good. Yeah. And he could play jazz as well? He played quite a bit of jazz, yes. It was a lot of work there. But the Halford came back here, and then he took up bassoons and English horns, and, and he became playing in theater pits, and I think he's still out in Las Vegas or someplace. Yes. Where they had the large orchestras for accompanying famous men, uh, singers and performers. So I've lost track of him. I'm wondering if he's still living. I remember going out to Hayes on the train. We'd take a train from Paddington Station to go to Hayes. I think it was over half an hour ride or maybe a little less. And we'd walk from the station to the factory. We go out there quite often. But those are the mornings I'd get to bed at three in the morning. We worked at two at the Mayfair. You know, I'd have to get up early to make a nine o'clock train or something like that to get to days yeah. for ten. So I didn't get much sleep on those nights. Yes, I had a lot of energy then. Too. Yes, well, I was young then. Yeah. Also, this time you were backing quite a lot of singers, weren't you, for the Rain Records, like Leslie Cerrone? Well, I did quite a few with him. Don't be cruel to a vegetable, and don't be the poor puss cat. Yes, I, yes, I made quite a lot. So, on Decker, too. I think there's one that we made, Little Pell on Decker. That was, and I have what I thought was a good song. Really? That was Leslie Cerrone singing the, his vocal chorus on it. Rhythm Maniacs, or Philip Lewis. I remember that uh, Pussycat and the other one, Ted Heath, when I went with Ambrose, he had the ring and knew that I had made it. So I remember him talking Ted about it. Yeah. Ted, don't know, I, I guess I was at the Savoy when I made that. Mm. And when I joined Ambrose, he mentioned to me that he had had it. Yeah. And they knew it was you on the solo. Exactly. They knew it was you on, on the yeah, solo. Yeah, he knew who had done it. Yeah, yeah. And Lou Abelardo. Yes, I made quite a few with him, too. But I didn't get to know him somehow. I, I know he was an American. But and Brian has sent me quite a lot of the ones that were not issued. So. And Jack Smith as well. Was yes, Smith. made quite a few with him with Carol Gibbons. Yeah. And I remember riding out there, coming back with Carol. No, with Jack Smith, he had a new Chrysler car over there. Jack Smith and Carol and I would ride with him. And I remember coming back from Hayes, Jack Smith is a whispering baritone, was he called? Yeah. Driving this new Chrysler on the left-hand side, which must have been strange for him. But, and in those days, they would have these... Uh, the lorries that you would you call them lorries, they ran by steam. It looked like a small locomotive. Steam a trailer. Yeah. Yeah. And we went by one of those, and I yelled out of the car, throw on some more wood. And it got a big laugh out of Carol. Of course, only an American would do that. <laughs> Us crude Americans. But I, I can still remember the laugh. Because I hadn't seen the, those kind of vehicles <laughs> there were quite a few around London that there were then, yes, in yeah. the 20s. Yeah. And we went by the little smoke coming out of steam, because they didn't hear what I said anyway. But I was throwing out some more wonders we passed. Still in 1928, you were also working with the Arcadians dance yeah, that was a with uh, Charles uh, Saxby. On. That's a firm in day two. They always used an organ. And we did those at the Kensington Cinema around Kingsway Hall. They had an art. Mm. So that's where the arcade is. Then we're at Madame Tussauds, Tussauds Cinema. And we caught it there. 
especially with Noble, we made the Indian love call Rosemary Selection. There were big selections there. Oh, yes. We recorded it. was the theater right next to Madame Tussauds' waxwork. Well, I remember making that Indian love call with Rosemary tunes, and I had a muted solo up near the footlights. And I almost fell into the orchestra pit because there weren't any musicians there. And Noble got a big laugh. He, he almost fell over. But the mics were far out. And I had a cup move solo. And uh, I was trying to get close. And I was near the footlights. I almost lost my back. Now, that was at the Madame Tussauds. Whether that was the name of the cinema or not, is, I believe it was. Mm. But it was right next door to the waxwork. Uh, it was an English cup music. I have one on the piano. It's in fact the same move. I can show really? it to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's one where you could adjust the cup. Yeah. Uh, different than the American yeah. cup music layer or fiber. This is a tin metal yeah. one. So I'll show it to you later. They would ask for the new. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I do what they wanted, of course. Well, on the very early um, Arcadian side, you played alongside Andy Richardson. Right? Yes. He had come from India. He was in the Viceroy's band. And uh, he had been there many, many years. And we knew uh, from talk that he wore a long underwear. He was cold from living in the tropics. And he did. They say you should either stay there or you come back to London. He didn't live long, about a year. He was gone. But he was a very nice man. Because he was at the Savoy with me, too. Yeah. He was in that band. And he worked with Ray Storita's band as well. I think he was. Yeah. 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 Did you ever get any offers to join other groups which you turned down? I mean, yeah. could you have joined the Ella Zaldi band or someone? No, I, I didn't have any offers that way, no. though. No. 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 Yeah. Um, well, that, of course, it was the greatest band in, in the world, I think, at that time. Yeah. Ambrose. Ambrose, yeah. yeah. Greatest so, dance band. So yeah. there wouldn't be any point in changing. Room, no. 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 Anyhow, mm. that was the best job in England. Mm. Out of all the musicians you played with in England, which ones were you most friendly with? Which ones? Which were your sort of pals who you... Well, I, Andy Richardson, we'd visit with him more. Well, then I was so busy, we didn't have time. Mm. I'd have to get sleep. I was recording practically every day. You see, that the second year, I can't remember how many days I did in 1928. I did quite a lot right away, you see. But it, the next year, I did 396 sessions. Not sides. Mm, just the sessions. Sessions. Yeah. From two to five, sometimes six, on rare occasions. Yeah. At least four average tunes. So that's a lot of recording. Did you work <laughs> sometimes seven days a week then? Oh, well, yes. Even on Sundays? I, I recorded on Sundays too. Mm. And I went out to Elstree in movies. Yeah. Some movies on. Uh, a couple of minutes on Sundays. He did movie sounds? Yeah, not a lot, but I, Carol had written a... Uh, That's right, a film track. He yeah. had wrote one, and uh, someone, I had to do it, they had a, had other trumpet players there. Mm. They had to redo it, they got me to play yeah. and remake them. I have one of the selections mm. that we did the same arrangements. Mm. Splinters was Splinters was a show. Yes, I have a ten inch SMB with the with all the tunes on it where I do have so much jazz of course, yeah. this melodic yeah. sound. And by the way, that's one of the nicest sounding recordings too. Well when you it, when you got the chance to have a bit of time off, what did you like doing best of all if you could? Well, well on a vacation we went to Switzerland one summer and then the Torquay one. Torquay. 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 Yeah. Yes. Torquay. Uh, and sightseeing, Windsor Castle, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And uh, I played two bus rides all around, had some picnics and some. You had a camera, so you were taking movies. We'd hop oh, on a bus. Yes. 
Mm. And we've got a Regent Park, Kew Gardens, and all that. Right, a 16 yeah. millimeter mm. movie camera. You still got the films? Yes. And in fact, I forgot until last night we re reread your letter oh, yeah. about the. Uh, you said you wanted to see, see the cinema. So, um, so I have. I haven't, uh, you see, that there's a blotter in these oil. They dry oh. after so many years. Well, that's the condition. You're modified. So I have, did, I haven't tried the projector yet. I might be able to run out that one this, okay. this afternoon. Okay, thanks. That I haven't right. run it for years. Yeah. We'll have to have a little picture here. Yeah. You'll see Paul Spectrum. We found one reel last night. I sh had forgotten your letter, so I didn't feel modified. But mm. it, it'll be ready. Okay. Here it is, here. Okay. Now, I haven't tried the projector yet, but I'll get that out this afternoon. Okay. That's a full spec, isn't it? Read the list. Spec span, California Rambles, Saratoga. Burt Lowe. Burt Lowe, Abbott's in Boston, Coney Island. Hudson River Trip, Van Tide Square. Well, anyhow, that's the. Uh, <laughs> That's edition one, that's all. There's yeah. a blotter in the bottom, and you yeah. put a little water in it, and it, I mean, it just makes it supple. supple. Mm -hmm. yeah. After so many years. Yeah, yeah. I sent one film to Canada, and they haven't returned it. But who's got the film? Is it somebody Up in Toronto? Yes. Somebody who's it to she, she does, she does uh, test, um, she documentaries for the yeah. government. Uh, uh, for the she made the big man in legend. Big yeah. man in legend film she made. Yeah. Documentary. And she's supposed to return it. Yeah. Well, uh, even over the phone, three, four months ago, she said she's going to send if she never had. Oh, that's not very good, isn't it? And the big picture of the New Yorkers, too, I took out of a frame to give to her. And lots of other things, though. Mm. She's never returned it. She's it. never returned it. That's not very good. And then she also... She also has New Yorkers. New Yorkers. New Yorkers. We send her oh, the no. New Yorkers picture. She the one with Charlie. Never returned it. Really really so I didn't get fixed because he slipped all day. That's too bad. Did he ever work with Jack Jackson? Yes, he did some dates with me. Did he? Yes, not many, but I can't remember which they were. They were, must have been with me dates. Yeah. I knew him. He was a very friendly soul. And a good jazz player. Yes, he? yes, he was. Yeah. And he had bent a mouthpiece and he had a funny way of his jaws were. Right, even. Oh. And the compensate. I got quite a bang on it, and he broke mouthpiece. Because he had a jacking four jaw. Or something. something good, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. He was obviously somebody who was a bit influenced by Bix, wasn't he? Oh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, the Brad Nichols and. Yes, yeah. And, uh, Do you remember that session you recorded with Jack Harris? I remember some of the sessions, yes. Mm. Yeah. Which yeah. one is that? The one with Matilda. Do you remember? <clears throat> When you took that yes, on Matilda. Uh, that was uh, listed under, um, and not the, the Harris, no, the Red Peppers. It, that was the Tunnies Florida. Tunnies Florida. I have yeah. that record. On Piccadilly? Mm. Yes. Yeah. I have that. It's a nice record. Yes, yeah. it is. Barney Sarkin's play on that little boy blue. That's Barney Sarkin, our first alpha. His, and Willie Land and Sam's brothers on piano. Willie Land was at the Embassy Club with Jack Harris. Really? That's what they played. And Sarkin was with me at the Savoy, and Broski was with me. Abe Aronson played at the club, though, playing Fry Sacks there. They only had this tenor and an alto there. Mm. Very small band. That was, it was kind of, that was the most exclusive club in the world. Right? Embassy. The embassy. All the royalty went there. So you knew Jack Harris, then you met Oh, yes, he was an American. Yeah, what was he like? He was a rich, well, uh, he was real tough. Yeah. Not on me, but he meant business. And... I've heard that as well from yeah. other people. They've said he's been yes, a bit yes. of a tough man. Yes, he was. Mm. He, he'd say anything. He, you never know what he's going to say. He never makes his words. He didn't bother me any, but no. he had the reputation of being that way. Short fingers, he yeah. we call it. <laughs> but he's just, have to kind of worry about being told off, I would say. Abe Aronson was a gentle soul. I think he really had the 
contract there. Mm. Hey, man. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about Ray Streeter. How did you get involved with Ray Streeter? Well, they just heard about me, would call me. I didn't yeah. have any agent or anything. No. They just the phone would ring me with a due date, and sometimes they would conflict. But if I was with Ambrose, I couldn't do, do it. it. Who was the Who was the other trumpet player in the band in the Ray Streeter well, band? Well, they had Mary. I think Freddie Pitt was a, occasionally there. Yeah. And uh, Richardson. Andy Richardson. Uh, I can't really remember who they were in that particular group. What was what was Ray Streeter like? Oh, he was he was played tenor sax, of course, and because there were three brothers, so he was easy to get along with. Yes, mm -hmm. very nice fellow. Yeah. No strife with him. Uh, uh, they came from the Boston area. Yes, originally. they came from Boston. Mm -hmm. and I didn't know them in Boston, but Simon's cousin had worked with the Streeters here. As he was a fine saxophone player. They had a saxophone six step, like the six Brown brothers that were in Baltimore. Way back, very famous six step. They went around the world. And they even made some records in Boston. And I held the records they made here because they had, Simon's cousin was in that group. Yeah. And they made vertical cuts. They were gray gull records started in Boston. But they didn't stay here long. They moved to New York. So I have some of those records of Andy Jacobson's that I was holding here. Some are vertical cut and they switched to lateral. And the Storitas were already well known here. Mm. And it's too bad that the daughter sold all those big photographs. Yeah. She's gone, I wish I had mm. got hold of those. You, you also recorded with Ray's brother, Al Storitas, yes. you, and the, and the big few, players. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. With the, quite a few people that you already knew very well, like Perry yes. Reed and... Joe Bradley. Joe Bradley's there, yes. And, yeah. and Ted Heath was on some of those days too, on yeah. trombone. When you were always at called to be in the studios and you were in great demand as a sideman, and, and a lot of other Americans were as well um, doing studio work, did this ever cause any friction between you and any and English players oh, at no, all? No, no. no. So you both worked together very yes. well. Yes, oh yes. That's the first thing I know when they stopped me from recording, but there was never any mm. animosity shown or anything like no, that, no. no. Mm. But they were all gentlemen, I thought. No strife or jealousy, I didn't think so. Uh, how did you come to join the Ambrose Band? Well, Joe Brandon recommended me to Bert Ambrose, and he, mm. and he lived nearby. He wasn't living in the same building at, at that time, but he had recommended me to the Furmans. And so he just said he wanted to join Ambrose, that's all. Mm -hmm. I didn't know Ambrose. What was Ambrose like to work for? Well, he was, <clears throat> he was sort of a peculiar type. And he, was very, uh, he was a temperamental fellow. He didn't get trusted or anything like that. But he was high strung and, and especially when he'd go to Paris or something, the 2K of those gambling places in France, Monte Carlo. And if he won, he came back, he'd feel great. But if he came back and had lost, he was a sour puss and wouldn't talk to anybody. <laughs> For a long Three time. weeks, I think. Mean. Right. <laughs> yes, but he wasn't uh, mean to us or anything like no. that. He was high strung. Highly strong, yeah. Because he was a gambler, of yeah. course. And Everyone knew it. He played golf for many pounds per hole with his friends because he played with all the wealthy people and other band leaders and whoever could afford it. Yeah. <laughs> he was a real gambler. I've heard of him losing sort of great amounts of money in um, yes. Monte Carlo. And I have golf. articles that someone has sent me about him too and when he died. Yeah. And the, he admitted that he had done that. He mm. wasted a fortune. Mm. Yeah. He had a good band, just yeah. the same. Yeah. And it went along whether he was there or not. They didn't fool around or get him. The management didn't seem to care. We played anyhow. Mm. It, was a, it was a very friendly group of yes. musicians, yes. wasn't it, the Empress yeah. Band? Uh, they were not late to, uh, on the job, and no one was as drunk or drunk anything or like that. No tardiness, I wouldn't say. Mm. So when they you were reliable. Reliable, yeah. They meant business, yeah. yeah. All very good 
wasn't any dead wood in the band. To say, do you regard the Ambrose Band as the best band you played for? I always thought it was the steadiest beat. Mm. And Jimmy Darcy, as I've mentioned many times, came over. And he said we had, he came over with Ted Lewis. Jimmy Darcy did. And he told me um, that we had the best band in the world. They hadn't heard it in this country. You see, our recordings were not issued over here. Mm. I remember he heard Blue Was the Night, that new solo range, but no jazz in it. And he thought, boy, that was quite an arrangement. And it is a very musical arrangement. Yeah. If you know that one, if you listen yeah. to it sometime. Whilst you were in the Ambrose band, you were also doing freelance work. What did Am Ambrose think about this? Did he well, ever... he didn't say anything to me, but I suppose he... I don't know if he knew how much I was doing. He didn't say... The only thing he didn't like was... Uh, he made some remark when he had heard one of my cornet solos played over BBC, one of the ones Zonophones or Deckers, and he was kind of put out because I had to let him know. I guess he would have wanted to manage that. Yeah. That's all. Mm -hmm. He only made one remark about that, but I can't remember just what it was. He didn't like think that I should have gone on my own, and he told him there's me playing the <laughs> trumpet solo. He wanted some sort of and management was, thing yeah. about it, yeah. I I didn't have a good radio over there. The story that is uh, on the tape to Ambrose, I had a, didn't have a good radio, but Joe Bradley had one. He let me take one for a while. And I tuned in. The first thing I heard from Eiffel Tower in France was one of my solos. They were playing it. Yeah. So I got quite a kick out of that in those early days to hear that. But then... Later, at one time, I, all I had was a five-shilling radio. It was a piece of uh, aluminum foil for an antenna over the curtain rod, mm -hmm. and, the, and an ears phone and a crystal. No, nothing to tune even, just about that big receiver. You could hear that London station, 2LO, mm -hmm. was it? 2LO, yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is funny. <laughs> We're broadcasting one night. Sandro wasn't there even, even for the broadcast. And Simon said he came and rang our doorbell and wanted to come up and listen. And he was in tails, and we didn't call him, suit of tails, and that silk hat. He comes up and Simon says, here's the radio right there, a five-shilling radio. And he listened to the whole program on that five-shilling crystal set. He didn't have a tune, he had a little wheel on it that get a sensitive play. Listening to his own band being broken. With a high selling <laughs> set with his tails on. <laughs> so well, I got a big bang out of that. <laughs> he must have thought I'd been saving up to be a miser or something. <laughs> but that's how I didn't have a chance to listen anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't know, we haven't I brought that thing home and I wish I had saved it. Who's been a collector's item? It was about two inches square with a little brass knob and no tuning to do nothing. Just a little crystal. There must have been a crystal inside yeah. of it. Mm. And it could be so powerful, it's all you needed. Mm. Now that cheap little hip set, phone set too, yeah. with it. Yeah. That's a lot. I'd better get this on tape about what you were telling me earlier about um, the Ambrose band not playing any of the uh, No arrangements at the hotel except for broadcast. Yeah. Once a week. 10.30 all... to 12. Mm. It was all during the week then. It was just... Just choruses of show tunes. Yeah. Popular tunes. Mm. We With... just kept playing. Mm. With just one break in the middle. was half the chorus. The sax is take a chorus and trombone and trumpets and... With no, no hot all. stuff at all. No, no jazz at all. I don't, I've never told Brian, and I'll mention it to Brian. Mm. But I felt sorry for the fellow from Finland. He came in the kitchen and stood near the swinging doors where the waiters were going in and out. And I thought they'd throw him out too. So he could hear it and see us at times when the doors opened. But he must have been bored. This I always think of that Finnish trumpet player. See, Max Goldberg came. Well, this fellow came over to, I told you this, I believe, mm. to study with Max. And he couldn't speak English. So he said he was from Finland. So Max somehow seemed to think that I could speak Finnish. So he knew I was a Finnish. So he said it to me. And he almost fell over when I was a really could speak the language. So he studied with me. He went back to Finland with a 
Well, that's <clears throat> Joe Riley knew all the publishers. And he was playing in an orchestra, and did. And that picture, he was yeah. in that band, that mm. Finnish band. So he went back with a suitcase full of soccer rangers. We got him for nothing. Now, I felt sorry. He comes to hear a band that didn't sound anything like the recording. How did you get to meet Danny Parlow? Well, I, I, he, Joe Bradley brought him up because he lived beneath us on the next floor. Yeah. When he <clears throat> came over to join the band, he brought him up and introduced him. <clears throat> what about D Joe Crossman? He was another. Yes, he was in and out of the band. He and Bert used to have some sort of disagreements. Really? And he joined Hilton, and he'd be back. Mm. And he'd leave. And I guess Danny did that a couple of times after I left, mm. from what I heard. Mm. But he always came back. Was Ambrose the, the best paid group? Yeah, I think so. Mm. I don't, I'm quite sure that was the highest paid group. Was it regarded by the public at the time as probably the best dance I band would think so. They were commercial recordings. They sounded good. Mm. I understand the royalty had Ambrose records. And sometimes in the background on these British movies you, of that era, you really hear yeah. an Ambrose recording. Mm. Did, did they ever make a film, Ambrose? No, well, I was with them, no. no. I, they probably did later. The Decca Studios were a bit um, uh, dampened down with cloth, weren't they? Which is yes. a bit difficult. Yeah, I have a picture with little big ragged yeah. little gashes. And I noticed on the album cover they fixed up the background. Yeah. But it was kind of... Yes, it was a, like playing in a little felt bag. Mm. The back yeah. pressure. Yeah. Didn't, it was not free blowing. Mm. And that's the way the, the Tiger Rag record of Philip Lewis sounds muffled. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the justice, see? Yeah. After this, this metal of a rubber. Ha <laughs> ha! 